Perfect. Okay, so great. Um, I'm going to talk, as I, as I said, uh, like full stack apps using Dart. Okay. So basically, before uh, starting, I'm going to introduce myself. So I'm Gianfranco Papa, and I am CTO and co-founder of Somnia Software. Somnia Software is uh, basically a dev shop uh, that we are 100% focused in, in Flutter. In fact, we are the only one in Latin America. Uh, then uh, I'm a software engineer uh, who specializes in uh, uh, front-end development in Flutter. And recently, I, I got the opportunity to start speaking about Flutter and my experience uh, since I started with Flutter um, like from the very beginning. Uh, so uh, that's something that really uh, uh, I'm really excited, like speaking in, in events. And I also organized the Flutter Montevideo meetup. So yeah, one of my goals is also like try to push on um, the uh, community in Latin America. Uh, not only in Uruguay, where I live. Okay, so enough about me. Uh, this is the agenda for today. Uh, we are going to cover uh, mainly uh, how and why should we uh, build full stack apps with Flutter and Dart. Uh, what are the main problems that we have today? Also, what is the current state of the art, especially in the, in the back end? Uh, also, we are going to cover a demo using the framework uh, for backend in Dart called Dart Frog. And uh, finally, we're going to explain some challenges and some uh, next steps in order to, for you to continue uh, searching about uh, this talk. OK, so first of all, like uh, as I was mentioning earlier, like uh, the, the purpose of this uh, session is mainly to focus on uh, Flutter developers that are currently uh, are focusing in Flutter and no Dart, but they don't actually uh, use Dart in the backend because they are used to use other technologies, such as, for example, uh, someone was mentioning in the chat Laravel, or maybe we're using uh, Node.js, a uh, different language, right? Uh, and I guess that something that really is really common for me to see is that uh, Flutter developers uh, because they are uh, focusing on, on Dart and Flutter, um, they rely a lot on different backend as a service. So they don't have to learn a different language and they can spin up different services that in a backend are really necessary. So these are really common examples. For example, Firebase, Amplify, or maybe some open source uh, solutions such as AppRide or Superbase, right? So I guess that uh, for me, this is uh, really great to use. Uh, I mean, I really encourage to, to use this kind of tool because they really, uh, there is a real benefit in, because we don't have to spend a lot of time like customizing our backend. But in some cases, we we feel that it's really limited, and in the majority of, of the cases, we, you will have to change your uh, like the way you are you are coding, right? Because uh, mainly you will have to use a different language. For example, in Firebase, if you want to start customizing your backend throughout uh, Cloud Functions, you will need to use type, TypeScript. So overall, it's, it's a different experience because you, you have to context, context switch a lot between Dart and TypeScript, for example. Uh, and yeah, some of these services are really tied to specific databases, for example, and are really limited on that. Uh, till that there are like really great services and there's an actual use case for that. But today I want to focus more in, in the problems that we experience by not using, for example, Dart in the backend. So mainly one of the problems that I identify is that there is, uh, there is uh, times where we need to build frontends that rely a lot on real time connectivity. So basically, in that moment, we need to analyze, uh, for example, if uh, our current solutions support uh, real-time connectivity, right? Imagine if we are uh, interacting with a backend, uh, we can do it um, normally, like the, the most basic thing would be to use a REST API. But if we need to have like changes in real time, this is something that we might consider when selecting different types of for example, backend as a service or uh, the way we are we're going to build our backend, right? So I guess that uh, this item is really well covered, for example, in Firebase, because you have this ability to have real-time connectivity, and that is something really 
uh, good that it has. But at the same time, uh, we personally, I feel that, like maybe there is a reason that we should stay using that, right? Instead of exploring different options, uh, because we feel like that works well, right? And another problem that I identified was the, that we have to use different programming languages like TypeScript, uh, as I was mentioning. Uh, and this overall uh, um, is uh, somehow uh, for us, um, I mean, we, we are developing on one language in, in Flutter using Dart, and then we have to context switch to TypeScript. And this overall reduced the, the developer experience that we have, right? And, and finally, uh, what I would like to say also is that there is an actual opportunity to, if we are using the same language, uh, Dart, right? Uh, we, can, we can start sharing code between the front end and the back end. And this is also another problem that uh, I identify because really it's really normal that, for example, we as front end developers try to ask different things to the, the developer, the development team who is responsible of, of the back end. And maybe when they change something in the domain, we, we need to uh, update the code in the front end. But by re by reusing the code, we can like somehow uh, not go over those problems, right? Of uh, of changes uh, because we will be sharing a lot of common code that can apply both to the backend and the and the frontend, such as for example the models, right? Okay, so those are our problems. Now I want to uh, briefly talk about the state state of the art uh, in Dart in the backend, right? because uh, I feel like it's not so well known as, as Flutter. So basically, uh, Dart in the backend uh, is not like uh, uh, it's really recent. In fact, it, it has been quite a, a lot of time since uh, we have this uh, um, opportunity to build backends in Dart. But uh, recently, there were uh, a lot of uh, frameworks, such as, for example, Dartfrog, that, I, in my opinion, incentivate to start building your your backend in Dart because it's like you have a, a lower barrier to to entrance uh, to to enter to to the world of Dart in the back. But there are like uh, really good options out there, such as Shelf uh, that is like uh, supported by by the team uh, in Flutter uh, in Dart that basically it lets you compose web servers. Then we have Dartfrog, who, who uh, we are going to focus more in, in the demo. But basically, Dartfrog is a higher level of abstraction on, on top of Shelf. So basically, uh, for those who have uh, interact with Shelf and, and, and feel like it's pretty low level, Dartfrog is, is like a higher level of abstraction and can be easier to start uh, creating backends in, in Dartfrog. Also, we have different frameworks, more complete ones that are more opinionated, such as Conduit or Serverpod. Uh, and I feel like this type of frameworks can be like more intimidating if you are starting from there, because uh, basically they have a lot of things, uh, not only like the way they handle routing, for example, in, in, an, in an API, but also the database, how they will deploy it, uh, or the use of Docker, for example. So uh, I guess that uh, I would I would suggest to start interacting with them uh, uh, in terms of like um, how beginner you are uh, using Dart in the backend, right? So in my opinion, like starting with Dartfrog would be something really easy to to jump in. Uh, okay, so uh, another another thing we noticed, like uh, as I was saying, this is not like something completely new. So it's been a lot since Shelf uh, has. Uh, achieved like 1.0. Uh, recently, we also have like server code that uh, also uh, achieved like the 1.0. So they are really solid right now. So it's a really great opportunity to start uh, using them. Because another fear that I, I listen uh, a lot is that, uh, well, if the library is not like 1.0, maybe I, I, I shouldn't use that, right? In the case of Darfrog, for example, uh, it doesn't mean that that is bad because if you think it, it is built on top of Shelf, who is like uh, already 1.0, right? So so yeah. Uh, then I'm going to talk about more of, uh, of Darfrog. Uh, that is the the framework that I select to explain uh, how to make a full stack app, and we are going to see in the demo like how how is the experience of of creating a full stack app. 
And basically, as I was saying, Dart Frog is a fast mini minimalistic backend framework for Dart. And it has like really cool features. Uh, for me, the, the, the most important thing is that it's really light, lightweight. So uh, by downloading the, the framework, you will start and you will be able to create a server um, in really no time. And it's really easy to do it, but it's not so opinionated. So it won't tell you how to interact with databases or, or any other things, authentication. It, does, it, it, it doesn't tell you how to do it, but uh, uh, the thing is that, um, yeah, it's really easy to, to start with, uh, with our frog. So basically, three characteristics, as I was saying, is fast min minimalistic backend framework for that. It, it is a high, higher level of abstraction on top of shell. If you want to, of shell, and there, there is an error there. If you want to, to, see, to see it like shelf in, in action. And it, it was made by uh, the open source team uh, at Very Good Ventures. And, and yeah, what, what can we say about Dart Frog, right? Uh, because yeah, any framework has to choose their own rules, right, in a way. So basically, these are the core concepts that we need to explain about Dart Frog. Basically, on one hand, like how it solves the routing. Uh, well, whenever we start creating backends uh, in, any, in any language, right, we need to define endpoints, right? Because we, we need to expose uh, uh, REST API, for example, and we need to define different endpoints that then the front end will be able to consume. And the way that uh, routing is handled in that flow is uh, it kind of resembles such as our frameworks out there, like for example, Next.js, uh, where, where like basically your folder structure and your file structure uh, inside your folders will define eventually the path that the route uh, would look like. What I'm trying to say here is that you will be defining uh, your API endpoints by only creating files in your folder structure in your backend, right? This is really inspired in other frameworks, as I said, and it's really handy because you don't have to configure a lot of boilerplate code to actually uh, create your, your, first, uh, your very first uh, route, right? So another concept we need to focus uh, and to explain is the concept of middlewares. This is also really important because uh, it is basically a function that is executed before or after uh, like a route is invoked. So this is really handy for cases, uh, for example, when you need to authenticate different routes, you, you might put some logic uh, before uh, the execution of each route and that is like you won't repeat yourself. You, you won't have to do it for every route. You only define a middleware and that's it. And, and also, for example, if you, if you need to log uh, everything in, in, uh, that is happening in the server, all the calls that are happening, that can be also a function that is executed after the, the, um, the execution of, of a route, right? So other thing that is uh, really important to mention is the dependency injection because Naturally, like our backend will start depending on different services. So Darfrog proposed a really cool um, uh, strategy on how to inject those dependencies in a routes in a way that is really clear and also resemble like, I mean, this problem is also a problem that we naturally have in, in every programming language as well in Flutter. Uh, so if you are familiar with, with that, I think that is like really, it really resembles on how to uh, inject your dependencies in Flutter in the build context, for example. So, and then another thing that is really important is the testing, right? We, th there is a, a clear way on how to test your routes uh, by mocking your dependencies uh, using best practices. And another cool, interesting thing that was recently added to Darfrog was the support for WebSockets. This is um, something that wasn't added to the core uh, library uh, because uh, what we were explaining that the idea is that it's like really lightweight and you can continually uh, continue adding like different uh, libraries uh, that support different, different things. Uh, in this case, for example, WebSockets. So this will be another library that is called Darfrog WebSockets that you will be able to add it and use uh, like uh, with Darfrog. 
Awesome. So great. And now I'm going to present a demo. So we can see in action like what I was talking about. And we are going to basically have an example of, a, of an application uh, made with Flutter and a backend made with Darkfraud and how we can uh, interact with them and how we can solve all, all of the problems or sharing code be between them. OK? Great. Oh, sorry. Yeah. OK, so I'm going to jump into VS Code. Let me uh, zoom, zoom in a little bit. So here I have um, VS Code open and also have a simulator, an iOS simulator. And the idea, and also we have uh, Postman because we are going to test our routes in Postman. So I'm going to briefly talk about like this example. Uh, this, this is what for me a full stack app should look like, right? We have in a in a single repository what is called a mono repo. We have like the client on the server living in the same repository, and one of the benefits will be that the client and the server could uh, start sharing some code. So I'm going to start with with a client that maybe is, is easier uh, to understand because it's made with Flutter. Uh, so basically, we have a really common structure here. Uh, we have our Passpec YAML that we are importing different libraries, uh, well-known libraries such as Equitable, Flutter Blog. We are using Blog for the state management. Uh, in essence, we only need a single feature. So in our lib folder, we are going to need uh, a feature called users. The idea of the whole app is to list uh, a bunch of users in, in a single screen, really basic thing. Uh, but the thing is that those users are coming from the server that is made with Darfro, right? So in, in the lib folder, we have the user folder. And we are separating the view from, from the blog, like really uh, basic thing. Uh, here, this is the presentation layer where we define our user view that is using a block builder that will react to all the changes of, of the block. And, and mainly, we are presenting a, a single list. Yeah, this example, I'm going to uh, have it in, in my GitHub, so I, I can share with you after. But I'm, I'm trying to go fast, in, at least in the front end, because I think the interesting part, the mo most interesting part is in the, in the, in the back end. But basically, here we are presenting a, a list that we are going to see eventually here in the screen. And in the blog, we are uh, handle, handling uh, our list of users, uh, our user status also, and really basic thing. We have a blog that basically interacts with a user repository. Uh, and their user repository is in our pure dart package. And this is a common uh, pattern. Uh, so we can, in a way, and uh, have a middleware that interacts with the data layer and, and the block doesn't necessarily know where the information is coming, right? So in here, we have our user repository that it can connect and it can connect uh, to an API client if we are using, for example, a REST API, or also it can connect to a WebSocket uh, server, right? Okay, so, uh, and then we have like uh, really, uh, in the main file, we are injecting all the dependencies, the user repository. We are initial, initializing the app and uh, injecting everything using a repository provider. This is from the block library. Uh, so yeah, more or less, like this is the how the the front end is is uh, working. Like we have a single uh, view, the uh, the user's view. And then we have everything supporting, uh, like with using best practices to support like the communication with, with the backend. So here, I want to jump directly to a server, right? So if we go to a server, this is, this is a Dart Frog project. And basically, it resembles a lot to a pure Dart package because it is, in fact, one of them. And the thing is that, uh, yeah, the, the, the first thing is that we are using Dart Frog, right? This is the dependency where we are using. We are also using Dart Frog WebSocket. And that I was mentioning that is a, an R library from Darfrog that has support for WebSocket. We are going to see like uh, how to, what are the difference between like uh, Darfrog and Darfrog WebSocket. But then what we can realize is that we can start using our, um, our dependencies that we are familiar of if we are using, for example, Flutter, like Equitable, HTTP, or even JSON annotation, build runner, JSON serializable. 
So at first, if we have to model our solution, we would go to the leaf folder. And for example, we will define our models in the backend. But the thing, the cool thing is that we only need to define our model once because the front end will start using those models. If we were uh, using another backend, this couldn't be like a chip, right? Because probably our models will be in a different language and we will have to repeat a lot of code. So this is one cool advantage that I highly suggest is that we only need to uh, create our models once. So here we have a, a user that is, it has an ID, a name, an email, really basic thing. Uh, uh, we have our from JSON and to JSON and the copy with, and we are using the equitable to compare uh, objects. And we can export all of this uh, as part of our package. So if we go here, we will notice that we are exporting all of our models that will be uh, used in our client, OK? Then uh, I want to focus in the folder that is called route, right? This is uh, the first thing that we will explain in, in the slides with our frog. So basically, if we want to start creating a custom API endpoints, we will need to define uh, in the route folder our structure that will be mapped to each endpoint. So in this case, I wanted to have an endpoint that is called uh, that, 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 that it can let me get all the users. So basically, uh, I want an, an endpoint. If we go to, uh, to Postman and go to the get users, we will have like, OK, local host in the port 8080, but we'll have an endpoint that is, it should look like API v1 users, right? Really uh, basic stuff. And if we go send here, this is uh, already sending me some users that are for testing purposes. But in here, it will match to this structure. Okay, I, I will have to define different folders for, for each path. And inside users, I will have to define an index file where we can start defining what it, it will happen on each request to that method. Okay, so whenever someone hits that URL, uh, the on request method will be executed. And here we will need to access to the HTTP method that uh, is being called. For example, in Postman, we can notice that we are using the get uh, method. But if we were using another one that is really common for a, for a URL, uh, for an endpoint, uh, we will need to differentiate like from what HTTP method is being called. And based on that, we will need to handle different situations. Imagine if we want to add a, a post method. Here we will have another if and we will handle the post or, or the put or the delete method, right? Um, well, actually, the put and the delete method will be handled in a different file because those are dynamic, right? It depends on the ID. By, but the, the thing is like that. You need to handle all of the method. And in this case, we are handled the on get request method. And basically, what we are doing is grabbing our user's data source. This will be uh, where we can, like, retrieve our users, right? Uh, it could be a database. It could be an in-memory uh, strategy, right? And then we need to execute a method like getting all the users from that data source and then just simply return a JSON with all the users uh, in a JSON format so our front end can start consuming those, those users, right? So if we go here, uh, the only thing that is missing, right, is, uh, OK, wh what is this user data source? Uh, if we go here, we can see that it's, it's a, an interface, uh, an abstract class that exposes different methods. So we can uh, interact with uh, basically retrieve the user from anywhere, right? In this case, we are using an in-memory user data source. And we have some hard-coded values here and uh, basically a list of users that is hard-coded, and we are only returning these users, but, or even we are returning these users by ID. So if, you, if we go here again to the routes, we have another file that is a dynamic file. That's why it has the brackets. And basically, this is the get by ID uh, implementation of the, of the endpoint, right? So here we will add a parameter that is ID, and we will still look for the get method and we will handle uh, that request almost the same way. We, we have to go to the data source. We have to get our, our user ID and return a JSON with a single user. So we go here again and go for get user by ID. 
we can start retrieving a user by ID, or for example, if I put two, it will be another user. So those are like, in a nutshell, how we can start creating things, uh, how easily the, uh, we can start creating things uh, such as REST endpoints, REST APIs in, in Darkfrog, right? So another thing that I, I would like to show you uh, is how we can create WebSocket support, right? WebSocket endpoints. And in this case, I, I already said that we need to uh, to add this other dependency that is called Darkfrog WebSocket. And the thing here, like the convention, will be to define an endpoint, but that is called uh, WS, right? So in this case, uh, it is almost the same, but we need, instead of uh, going for the index, we need to define WS. And we will have a special endpoint here that we can connect using WebSocket. So in here, uh, okay. Uh, we can disconnect and we can connect again and we see that there is an actual user. I, I already spoiled the, the demo because here we can see a, another user, so we'll see how the Flutter app is, is reacting. Uh, but, but yeah, first I, I want to show you how we can uh, establish uh, this uh, endpoint that is using WebSockets, right? So it's basically the same thing. The thing is that we will use uh, a block here and this is really also something interesting because if you are used to use block in the front end, you can use it in a way in the back end by using a special type of block that is called. Let me see. Um, we have here broadcast broadcast block. So basically, this will allow us to handle different connections because when the web socket is established, uh, we will will start receiving multiple connections and we need to update different clients at the same time. So this is a library that will help us uh, not write so, so much boilerplate code into our solution. And basically, when a new client has connected to our server, we need to subscribe that new client using block, right? So basically, the block, the state of the block will be handled different clients that we need to um, like uh, give give them the, the updates. Uh, then we simply send the current users to the to the client. Let's say it's the first time it was connected to the server, so we send the information right right on, and then we can start listening messages from the client uh, that we can handle based on some protocol that we define. Let's say the client is sending me um, the key add user or remove user. We will act on that key. And this is uh, something really, again, really similar uh, on how we react to events in, in Flutter using block, right? We add a, a different event to the block, and then the block will handle that, that, that event. And if we go into the, the block here, we will see that we have two different events, user created and user deleted. And in the state, we will have the list of the users. Uh, and in the block, we will be handling those events. For example, when a user is created, we will add it to our user list. And then, uh, uh, because we will be emitting a new state, uh, the library will automatically update everyone that is connected using WebSockets into uh, in, in Darkfrog, right? So basically, if we go again to the client, we will see that in our block, we are connecting to our WebSocket here. This is not uh, the best way to do it, but it was the fastest. And here we have a string subscription that we are listening for messages that are coming from, from Darkfrog, from the WebSocket. And basically, we will know in this case that Darkfrog is sending us the list of the users, and we will need to decode it in, in, our, in our format and, and put it on, on a list. And we will add, uh, finally, this event that basically Syncs uh, the whole block and and the the front end the Flutter app will be reacting to those changes. So, so in order to test this in real time, what I thought it was to use Postman that it has support to test WebSockets. We already uh, see this in action, uh, and we can connect to to the web server. Here, uh, if we go again, for example, uh, I want to show how to. To actually test your your Darkfrog server, and you really have to put in, inside your server folder Darkfrog dev, 
and this will uh, uh, start your server. And in the case of Flutter, okay, we, we can help restart because we already did uh, the Flutter run part. And here we see that there, there is no users. So again, if we connect here, we can see that we are connected and the user list is empty. And if we can, uh, if we start sending messages, here we have send and the list will be filled with an example user. And here in the application, we can see that it's reacting in real time. So this is a really cool um, simple example, uh, example on how to integrate Flutter with Darkfrog and using WebSockets, right? So you can achieve the, that real time behavior. And, and yeah, I mean, this is, um, this is what I wanted to show you. Like, uh, as I said, I'm going to put everything in on GitHub. I think it's already on GitHub, but, and this is like more or less the experience you will feel by creating full stack apps. Like we are using the same language, right? Dart, we are uh, having our simulator, Postman maybe for testing specifically things on, on the server. And we are able to share a lot of code between the front end and the back end, such as not only like uh, the code, but also the tooling, right? Like the different libraries that we use are the, the same and VS Code is, is almost uh, like a, a more smooth uh, experience, right? Okay, so moving on um, to our, the presentation again, let me just try to wrap everything. We were uh, in the demo and I wanted to also uh, uh, mention some challenges that if you're a Flutter developer, it can start happening to you if you start um, like creating your own backends uh, instead of uh, relying, for example, in backend as a service where these kind of things are, are really handled for you, right? Okay, the first thing is, is that we will need to create our, our own backend and, and maintain our own uh, uh, backend using, for uh, like, um, uh, for example, Dart, but we will need to write more code. Uh, then the deployment, uh, naturally, like we will need to deploy uh, our backend in, in a server, right? Uh, and this will be um, really easy because, uh, for example, in the case of Darkfrog, uh, it's uh, when when you create a project, uh, it creates for you a Docker image, so you can deploy that Docker image into uh, whatever you feel more more comfortable with. I put uh, there Cloud Run because uh, I think like it's a great option to to scale your uh, containers, but you can like uh, use a single instance, for example, and just deploy uh, uh, your Docker image. Then another thing that can happen to you is that you will need to start uh, thinking about uh, the databases, right? Uh, you will need to select what is um, the, the most uh, suitable da database for you. Uh, maybe uh, it is a, a relational or a non-relational or even a graph database. But you have that flexibility because nothing stops you to try to connect from that to uh, to uh, another database, right? Another thing that I need, I think that is really worth mentioning is caching, right? This is uh, one of the challenges that start happening in the in the backend uh, when you need to optimize some reads, right? Um, let's say in this example, like the users don't change so much, and, and there are like lots of users connecting to the to the backend. Maybe we can have a new memory strategy like we had and try to cache somehow the list of users instead of going to retrieve that uh, list of users from the database each call, right? So this is really connected on how we ultimately deployed, deploy our solution because we will be uh, handling a, a lot of state in the server uh, and we need to synchronize uh, all of that state in each instance that we are deploying. And finally, also I wanted to mention the authentication, right? Uh, in each backend, you will need to handle uh, authentication. This is really common. You can still use uh, things like um, like Firebase authentication, right? And, and the CI CD part will be also something really interesting to dig in because, uh, yeah, it's, it's a good practice also in the backend, not only in the front end. Uh, and yeah, um, I think that overall, these are all the challenges that when you jump in into the into the backend in Dart, you will need to take care. Um, so, so great. Let me see, um, uh, like just final um, 
steps and the next steps here uh, for me would be okay uh, this is was a, a demo on how like full stack apps work in uh, using Dart, right? But you can see, for example, documentation. This is pretty clear in the case of Dart Frog. If you want to continue investigating on that, also I wrote a, a blog post uh, explaining all this and all the access. Uh, uh, it's really separated the blogs between REST APIs and web sockets, and you can see it uh, separately, uh, and you can see like code in action and a step by step. And also, uh, there were like um, really recently the, there was the, the Flutter Forward event where I saw two different talks that I got inspired to create this this talk. There are real time games with with Dart, where they explore basically a full stack app, but uh, in addition they put also Flame, so that's really cool also. Uh, but they explore how to handle this kind of uh, web socket connectivity. And also that uh, the other talk is top cloud development tips for Flutter developers. That is what we were seeing in the, the last uh, slide. That is mainly like challenges that could potentially appear to you if you're starting to use uh, backend, for example. So, so yeah, that's that's it. Uh, so thank you for 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 this opportunity. Um, those are my uh, social uh, networks. If, if you want to. Uh, like contact me, and and yeah, I, maybe we can uh, like uh, see the the Q and A. Uh, so if you have any questions, uh, we can start uh, answer it. Okay. So I'm going to wait. I'm going to go to the Q and A. Remember, if you if you want to to ask something, uh, maybe I I will focus on the Q and A uh, chat uh, instead of the of the regular chat. So let me see. Okay, so uh, the first question uh, is that John Ju is asking, can you share the GitHub repo link so we can follow along uh, on our own? Yeah, of course. I mean, I'm going to share it uh, right, right now. Let me see. As I said, there are like two repositories. Um, actually, it's one repository, but the thing is that um i i separate uh, each of uh, each example in different um branches so you can see okay dark frog uh, in the main branch uh, like the the basic thing then in another branch you can see how to use websocket so i can definitely copy and paste this in the chat Wait. okay um also if if you want to ask like uh, questions like directly instead of the chat uh, uh, really go for it, but still I'm going to keep reading. Okay, so we have Pablo saying, sorry, maybe I missed it, but where is the connection to, act, to the actual database is made? Okay, uh, great question. Let me go back to the example. In this case, we are not using any database because it is a simple example. And if we go to the Dart Frog um, server, we will see that uh, in here, the in the, the index file, this is like how it is handled. The they get all the users. The users data source, even though it's it's a, um, it is an abstract uh, implementation, we have a concrete implementation that is an in-memory users data source. So in this case, we are using uh, this strategy. So it's like really hard-coded state in the server. Uh, it will start with the with the users, um, the sample user, it could also start with with non uh, with uh, non uh, users like at all. But in the case of the WebSocket, uh, really the the entry point for for the users will be the state of the block in this case. So here we initialize uh, our list with the empty list, right? So yeah, uh, this is something that eventually could be uh, a connection to a database, if, if you like, uh, any database, and start retrieving everything from that. But the cool thing is that if, if you will follow this pattern, you will be able to switch your implementation, and this won't impact on, for example, on your routes, because they are like relying on, a, on an after class instead of a, of a concrete implementation. And actually, I, I think I forgot to to show how this is injected we are using a special type of of middleware uh, that is used that is called provider and we are providing to our 
handler to our uh, yeah our endpoints a valid uh, concrete implementation of the user data uh, data source okay so here is where you will need to put another type of data source such as a database uh, data source okay and then below the, there is a uh, database uh, is an object there is a DB, the data source is an option. Okay. And this, I think it, it was asking, um, trying to reply to the other question. Uh, Summit is saying, okay, hey, amazing session. Many, uh, many thanks to you. We are recently released our MVP product using Firebase as backend, basically Firebase function, but we are looking for our, our own server for more control. So I was asking if we should switch to Dart server in production. I'm really concerned about the packages that we go, gonna use for backend and in Starfrog support will be long-term. Also how, if I'm defining my data model, it can be used in client. If so, then it's possible to call other methods. Okay, and those are a lot of questions there. Let me start with, with your concerns about Firebase and, and Darfrog. This is really, uh, something um, that I, I would highly suggest to really think what are your requirements, right? It really depends. Uh, I guess that uh, all of the prob problems that we um, uh, identify, uh, I guess that you will need to put it in, in the balance if you want to um, like encourage the, the use of uh, reusing shared code, have your custom uh, backend with more flexibility, defining your other databases, because if you're using Firebase, you can use Firestore, for example, because uh, there is the real-time database, but you only have the ability to connect to, to those uh, types of uh, databases, but you gain a lot, right? Uh, it's not like, uh, uh, like going for Firebase is wrong. I, I guess that it will depend on, yeah, again, on, on your requirements. If you want to uh, have like a full uh, customization of your backend and try to reuse different uh, sharing code and reuse uh, a lot of the things that you're already using Flutter. So, so yeah, I, um, what I could say also is that, uh, I mean, there's a lot of opportunity to start uh, using Dart Frog or any type of backend in Dart. Uh, it's really solid, so yeah, I really suggest uh, for you to uh, at least consider that option and try to estimate uh, in terms of time what would be easier. And in, te in terms of scaling, I mean, uh, we, we uh, saw this example that we can uh, use uh, web sockets and we can also eventually deploy our server to Cloud Run, so that really scales uh, uh, really well. Uh, and yeah, it lets you like control more. Uh, and the other question was, uh, was an R uh, in the same was, okay, how we can define data model, uh, it can be used in our client. So, yes, so basically I, in here, I show how to define our, our models here. So we can create any type of model here and we can export it as part of our Dart Frog server. Let me see here. Here we are, we are defining all the models. And in our front end, we are directly using it. For example, in our blog, I think. Uh, we are we are using uh, let me see. As we are, yeah, we are uh, using our users API, we have access to every model that contains uh Darfrog, right in the server. Okay, so then we have um, Mohammed, I'm trying to go over the all of the questions. We have like uh, Mohammed that is asking which servers uh, support Dart Dart backend hosting. Can we host it on a PHP server? Okay, so uh, I'm not sure. Um, like the, this question, I guess that for me, you are trying to ask like what would be uh, like a good option for hosting Dart as a backend. And I guess that as you, if you're familiar familiar with Docker, uh, I mean, any type of server that you can install Docker there will be uh, enough. Maybe it could be AWS, uh, a single instance, instance of EC2, or maybe Cloud Run, as I, as I said, that uh, lets you manage all the, the containers and scale it. But if you can deploy it using Docker, uh, I mean, 
you can deploy it in, in any server that you that you want. Uh, so I hope that that was like a good an answer for your question. And then we have uh, okay, we have another question from let me see As Asmai. I, I I hope I'm pronouncing well your name. Is there any way to host API on IP address instead of local host? For example, in Laravel, we can do it like this PHP or Artisan serve host IP address. Okay, so that's a good question. I I think there is a way to, this is probably something that in the Darfrog documentation is really well explained and they're advanced. Uh, you can actually uh, change the port, but I don't know like if you, if you uh, can uh, change the API. I think you can, but you you have to define your own server because what we saw is like the basic creation of Darfrog that it really handles the, all of the things for you, but it lets you customize the, the different things. So if you, if you go to the to the advanced um, like section in in what would be Darfrog documentation, I guess that there is an option for that. Uh, here and like custom server entry point. So yeah, I will say that if it's not an option, there's really a roadmap that they are like doing like a lot of things. So so yeah. Um, okay. So yeah, let me go for the last question. So those are really long. Let me see. Okay, we are using uh, John uh, again. Ju uh, is asking. We are using Firebase South, Firebase backend. Guest, guest stream IO for real time messaging, Flutter up. We are using guest stream for data store, but wondering if we need a backend to tie things together, but want uh, as fast as, uh, but want as fast as Flutter. Would Darfrog be a good uh, alternative? We are thinking of using Supabase, open source Firebase, uh, or Upright, but I love writing everything in one language. Right, I mean, this is kind of the, the, the point, right? Um, when you start, I guess that in those types for, of architectures where you relied on backend as a services, you start relying uh, a lot on on those services. And uh, even though I think that that really scales a lot well because there is a really nice integration between Fire, uh, Flutter and Firebase, maybe it is really difficult to start uh, identifying what, what is happening because you uh, start adding different services such as guest stream and you have to keep everything synchronized maybe with cloud functions and, and maybe a uh, uh, backend with our frog uh, would ultimately like be a single source of truth for your front end where they can start communicating through uh, a single uh, yeah, backend, right? And then the backend is in charge of uh, try to expose everything else. But yeah, I, I mean, I'm not saying that that is bad, but but yeah, you need to analyze like uh, in terms of maintainability also what would be the best uh, approach there. Okay, then we have uh, another uh, question from John. Okay, uh, great. Well, well, John, <laughs> you you ask another question. That that's great. Do you recommend using Darfrog for quick MVP or production level apps? Uh, because we have a tech for soulful impact company that helps create high value, high, val high value MVPs really quick. We've used uh, shitty.co, which uses a Google sheet for the crude API, for example, and built a Flutter app in seven weeks. Do you recommend we use Darfrog for that? Okay, um, I would like to check uh, those links, but and if you can send me uh, later, but yeah, I mean, in terms of like MVPs, I, I will suggest th this is really, uh, I mean, one big reason would be that uh, basically if you feel comfortable enough with Darfrog and you like have really the ability to use different libraries and you have your, your flow really well set up, because imagine if you start uh, facing all of the challenges that we mentioned in your MVP just for deployed or or uh, having basic things set up, I will suggest to keep using Firebase because uh, maybe uh, you will be able to have more things out of the box, maybe. Uh, that's why I said it depends on your expertise in Darfro. Uh, and then uh, you will mm, potentially reducing your cost in the backend by only using Firebase and you will releasing your 
and maybe faster. But but yeah, I mean, it really depends, right? If you are really uh, had a good experience in in Dar in Dar Frog and you can start uh, cutting the time by reducing all, all the code between the front end and the back end, and that also could potentially increase the efficiency in, in the team because maybe and now you are you are like creating more uh, faster like your solutions by by using the same language. Okay, so we are going to see the last questions. I hope like I, I can answer uh, everything. We are we are almost on time, but I I, I had like uh, assigned ten minutes more or less for questions. But okay, we have thanks for the talk. Uh, there are uh, team is saying th thanks for the talk. As you mentioned, there already were some attempts to fit Dart in backend development. Not sure if this is production ready, although it seems. Definitely useful to dig in backend and t-shape yourself. Also, I can imagine using this as a mock server for for Flutter app. Right? Yeah, that's and um, yeah. I mean, uh, I think like the the thing is that yeah, this under hood is using shelf that uh, this is proven that it scales for production. Though, so uh, I wouldn't have any fear on, on taking this into production. And, and in terms of mocking your server, that, that could be a really uh, useful um, use case, right? If you are developing and you have um, a local uh, server that you want to mock different things, that could be uh, something really useful to have. So you can then switch to another uh, another backend, let's say. Then uh, we have Pablo that is saying, thanks for the response. Another one, in Firebase, you can use it offline. And when you get online again, the data synchronize itself. Can we get the same be be behavior with Darfrog? OK, this is one of the main, main benefits of using Firebase, that um, it has a really nice integration, and it has an SDK for Flutter. And one of the main things that I, I think that uh, is, uh, is not like as use as it should be used is the the offline behavior, right? So when you realize you can start using Firebase with uh, offline um, support, uh, this is really a game changer feature for me for, for Firebase that currently is not supported in Darfro because you will need to implement that logic uh, like uh, yourself, right? Then there's not really something that does that for you. But, but yeah, I mean, uh, this is, uh, it could be a, a yeah, that feature that if is really important, I would highly suggest to use uh, uh, Firebase. Yeah. And then our last question, we have Summit that is um, asking, any database recommendation to use with Darfrog? Also, I have one doubt that if we use Firestore with Dart backend, will it be slow? Because from client side, we'll be requesting our backend, and then our backend will be requesting Firestore. Right. So. Any database recommendation? So I will suggest to use, for example, Postgres, which is a really cool database. Uh, it's like a relational one, but it has like some features that resemble more a non-relational one. So it's really like best of both worlds. And uh, you have like different ORMs to, to connect to that database. Recently also, uh, I think um, the Dart team published something to that they have a an ORM for MongoDB. So that is another database that I really, I highly recommend. I, I, I work a lot with that, that one. And it's really easy to interact with and that it will be a non-relational, right? But I mean, it really depends on, yeah, on your, your requirements because maybe that answer will be, okay, based on my requirements, which is the database that uh, really solves my, my problems, right? Um, yeah, but uh, I guess that uh, starting with Postgres would be, would be a, a great choice. And, and the other question, yeah, I mean, the thing is that, yeah, now that we uh, interact with our frog in our front end, maybe that frog will need, will need to interact with Firestore. And that, that will be, uh, yeah, I mean, in, that will be a middleware that we have because uh, in our first solution, we have like Flutter connecting to Firestore directly, and, and now we'll have like Darfrog connecting to Firestore. But that doesn't mean that uh, we'll be having a, a, a slower solution. And then we have, um, can we use multiple database with Dart? Yeah, 
so basically um, i mean i'm not thinking right now in a potential use case for this but you you can eventually like uh, use different databases for example i mean if you're using uh, your database you're using postgres and you want to include a, a cache database such as redis you can include that as well and you can start uh, answering your request faster by using redis as a cache that will be like a a really complete solution that that really touches uh, the whole the whole stack and really solve all of the problems, including like deploying to Cloud Run that that I put it on on the slides. Um, here, here, all the challenges. So that that could be like a solution that includes all, all the all the challenges. Okay, so I think we we made it. Uh, we we were able to answer the questions. Thanks for. For, uh, for the questions, uh, it was really nice to not only have the, the session, but also that that I had the possibility to, to answer all of the questions, that uh, it's really uh, a good thing uh, whenever you, you have a session that uh, motivate people that, that ask uh, different questions. And, and yeah, maybe we can, we can wrap it right now. I'm going to share with you um, my social network here again. So we can be in touch. I, I'm going to put it on on the chat. Uh, and yeah, I, I already shared the the code base. Um, you know, like there are different branches. You can see these different implementations. Uh, yeah, it was really nice to be here. And uh, let's stay in touch. Okay, I'm going to leave now. Thank you.